Welcome to the Friends of Tassington Classics for All lecture. This is an annual lecture celebrating the fact that uh, Friends of Classics, which was started by Jeannie and myself in 1991, uh, spawned off Classics for All and uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's been a tremendously exciting year for, for those of us who have spent most of our time studying classics, teaching classics, talking about the ancient world, writing stuff about it, because Classics for All, in a year or two's time, will have doubled the number of schools in the UK which is, which is teaching classics. Doubled. <laughs> and that means tens of thousands of school children who have had no chance of meeting, the, of, of getting to grips with the fascination of the ancient world, uh, will now be able to, an ancient world which, after all, lies at the root of our civilization for a very practical reason. The Greeks are the first Westerners to write literature, and the Romans are the second Westerners to write literature, taking on from the Greeks. And that literature contained oh, the roots of our educational, uh, political, uh, cultural, uh, uh, intellectual world, uh, from philosophy, history, you name it, the Greeks, and then the Romans got there first. They are literally the roots. So it's, it's absolutely marvellous the work that Classics for All is doing. We're also enormously fortunate in having such wonderful exponents of the ancient world in our, in our media, uh, at large as well. Bethany Hughes, Michael Scott, Mary Beard, of course, and Tom Holland, whom we have here this evening. His book, Rubicon, burst upon an astonished world. How long ago was that, Tom? Ten? Oh, goodness. Long time ago? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. 18 years ago? Yeah, he's a long years ago. time ago. <laughs> long. And he's con continued producing books of that quality, television shows and, and radio. And so we're in enormously fortunate to have him here this evening. The program you have in front of you, uh, after Tom has talked and we've questioned him intensely, Friends of Classic Seminars were crisscrossing questions the whole time. The speaker could never get a word in edgeways for the audience asking questions. So don't be, don't be afraid to ask questions, and you'll see the rest of the program there. Uh, we'll have a little talk from someone who's working with Classics for in the school, and then Christopher Clark, our treasurer, will, will end with a, a few words. So our guest speaker this evening, Tom Holland. Well, thanks, Peter, for making me feel incredibly ancient. <laughs> Which is fitting, I suppose, for an assembly gathered to celebrate um, the ancient world. And um, I'm particularly thrilled, I gather, that there are uh, students here from Wandsworth, is that right? Yay! And Harrogate, and Barnet, and unbelievably, I believe, Woking. Knowledge uh, <laughs> beyond belief that you've come all the way from Woking. And I have to confess that um, it makes me feel guilty because um, I have an admission to make, which is that the talk I'm going to give tonight, such as it will be, um, is not going to be as fluent and smooth and well honed as I would ideally have wanted. It is not going to be as Ciceronian as any speaker on the ancient world aspires to be. I have no slides, I don't really even have a plan. And the reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, and I know that it's a terrible thing to get your excuses in early, but the reason for that is that I am up against the deadline from hell. Now, of course, the famous deadline that, um, that uh, was failed to be met in antiquity was Virgil's, who was um, hurrying to finish off the Aeneid and then died. Um, I'm hoping that that's not, you know, I don't face a deadline quite as serious as that. But I do have to get the book that I've been doing for the past three and a half years in by this Christmas, or I'm going to have to return all the money the Americans gave. So it is an unbelievably serious situation. And if I give you some sense of the sweep, perhaps you'll understand why, um, why I'm feeling slightly pressured. Um, this new book begins uh, on the banks of the Hellespont uh, in 479 BC. A Persian is being crucified on its banks by an Athenian flotilla commanded by the father of Pericles. 
Um, and this serves as a kind of a, a, a clothes hanger. This opening episode serves as a kind of clothes hanger for an insanely panoramic sweep over, um, over antiquity at that point, um, including the Persians, um, Babylon, um, Athens, and then we move to Alexandria. And then in the next chapter, um, we look at uh, the emergence of um, the Jewish scriptures, Again, going way back in time, back to Canaan, back to the Babylonian exile of the Jews, back to possible influence on Jewish scripture of, 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 of Persian kingship and, and Persian dualism. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a broad sweep, and it continues at a hubristically broad pace. So we have Pompey storming Jerusalem. We have... Um, we have a temple to Augustus being raised in the province of Galatia. Then the kind of the clothes hanger event in the, the, next, um, the next chapter is uh, a scene in an amphitheater in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. Then we have Julian the Apostate visiting a temple in Galatia again and discovering that it's, it's been abandoned pretty much. Um, then we have um, an abandoned temple to Apollo on a mountain in the south of Italy, uh, and a mysterious uh, vision of a figure firing an arrow which turns in the course and kills a villain. It's an excellent story there. Uh, and then uh, finally in this section we have um, a galley pulling into Carthage in the year 634. So, 150 years, pretty much, um, after uh, the fall of the empire in the west. But of course, the Roman Empire is still going strong, ruled from Constantinople. So, you know, a a as I say, a massively hubristic sweep. However, that is only a third of the book. <laughs> and when I tell you uh, that the past week I finished the chapter that I was doing just this afternoon, that it's about the writing of Imagine and the murder of John Lennon, and Paul McCartney's performance at Live Aid, when those of you, lots, to lots of you, this will be very, very ancient history, but some of you may remember Paul McCartney sitting at the piano right at the climax of Live Aid, singing Let It Be, and the microphone cut out. And so you might think, what on earth is, uh, is all this doing together? What on earth is Paul McCartney, and uh, John Lennon, and James Brown, and Bob Dylan, all of whom are mentioned in the chapter I've just finished, what have they got to do with uh, Pericles' dad? Well, this book is my attempt to explore what I think is the most fascinating and the most influential legacy of the classical world into the present. And it's one of the very few that can be traced in a kind of continuous line from antiquity right into the present. I suppose that um, another one might be the study of Virgil. You know, he didn't finish the Aeneid, but who cares? It, it, it's still the great masterpiece of Western literature, and it's been studied continuously every year since, since it was finished. But my theme is, is a broader one. It's a more influential one. And I'm looking at um, a kind of nexus of beliefs and practices and assumptions and ethics and morals that draw from Greek philosophy, that draw from Roman law, that draw from Persian conceptions of kingship and of good and of evil. And above all, of course, it draws from Jewish tradition, from Jewish scripture. And you will have worked out by now that what I'm talking about is what we today call Christianity, and by the second century AD was coming to be called Christianismos. So this is a, a, a category, the idea of something called Christianity is something that is very ancient <coughs> and that continues into the present day. However, in a sense, it is a measure of the impact of Christianity that it has evolved in such a, a multiplicity of ways that that word Christianismos, as used by 
Christian philosophers back in the second century AD and our word Christianity, there is a sizable gulf in signification. What we mean by it and what someone back in the second century AD would have meant by it is treacherously different. And by extension, even more so, if I say, well, what is Christianismos? And today people would say, well, it's a religion. And people would probably say that it is one of a number of religions. So Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all these would be categorized as religions. And if, we were to, if I was to say furthermore, you know, well, what, what do you think we mean by a religion? I think probably most people would say, you know, it's slightly kind of ambivalent, slightly contradictory, two contradictory things. But I think above all they would say that a religion is something that um, exists in a kind of distinct way from the rest of society. So you can talk about um, church and state. Religion is, is, is something that, you know, it has, an, it, ha, it has a GCSE, for instance. You go and you study religion in, 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 in the GCSE. Um, if you read um, you know, a, a, a book about um, India or about um, the ancient world or something, you'll have chapters on you know, the religion of the Hindus, the religion of... Um, the Egyptians, the religion of the Greeks. And it's accepted that this is something that is, that, that is separate from the rest of society. And, and against that, there is also, I think, a sense that, that a religion is about, it's what an individual believes. So you say, you know, what is your religion? Are you, you might say you're a Christian, or a Jew, or a Muslim, or a Hindu, or whatever. It's, it's something that defines you personally, that defines you individually. And there is a kind of lurking sense there of that, that, that this is about an individual's relationship with kind of aspect of the divine, an aspect of the supernatural, perhaps a, a personal God. And the problem with this is that um, when we use that English word, religion, and we back project it, and we, we talk about the religion of the Greeks, or we talk about the religion of the Romans, or we even talk about the religion of, of the Jews in um, back in antiquity. There is a massive, massive risk of anachronism, and really, I want to talk tonight about what that risk is, and to demonstrate exactly how it was that our conception of religion today, yes, emerged from antiquity, but over the course of that evolution became something really radically quite different. Now, I've brought with me two books which have been hugely influential on me over the course of my writing about classical antiquity. Um, so this is by Walter Burkert, great German scholar, Greek religion. I mean, it's, it's an absolutely masterly account of what I suppose we might call Greek cultic practices, the Greek gods, um, Greek philosophy even, um, and there you have it, Greek religion. Um, and then this one, uh, Religions of Rome, um, by John North and Simon Price, and well before she became the world's most famous woman, Mary Beard. Um, again, a hugely influential book on me. Um, so I was reading these books while I was, so I was reading this while I was um, writing about, while I was writing Rubicon, all the, you know, those 400 years ago. Um, and I was reading this while I was writing about the, the ancient Greeks and Persian fire. Um, but it, it kind of pressed on me that this word religion was highly difficult. So, and I was kind of alert, sufficiently alert to it that um, I think the whole way through both Rubicon and Persian fire, I never actually used the word religion. And what's interesting about this is that despite the title of both these books, I think when you read through them, again, they don't really talk about religion. So the headline is there, the title is there, but there's clearly a kind of nervousness on the part of scholars of using this 
this word. And part of the reason for that is that um, we don't really have an analogous word in either Greek or in Latin. So the, the, the word that is often um, cited in Greek for, for being equivalent to our word religion is threskeia. Um, when I was translating uh, Herodotus, threskeia was pretty much on every, every page. But it was evident that this, Herodotus was not talking about anything that we would recognize today as religion. Um, he's, he's kind of talking about rituals, really. He's talking about the cultic practices, the sacrifices, the priesthoods that enable human beings to feel a sense of communion with the gods. Um, and as the word evolves over the course of, um, over the course of the centuries, the word varies, it can mean, um, uh, in the New Testament, for instance, it appears in the New Testament, where it, it kind of seems to mean worship. Uh, and in the writings of, of Philo of Alexandria, the great uh, Jewish scholar of the first century AD, it, it seemed, he genuinely seems to use it as meaning sacrifices. So there's something there that is very, it's, it's kind of what we might call religion, but it's not quite. So, well, what about Latin? Of course, the, the, our word religion derives from a Latin word, religio. And actually, when I was, um, when I was uh, doing, uh, so old that I didn't do GCSEs, I did O-levels. And we did uh, Latin O-level. And one of the, the texts that we did was um, Lucretius's great poem, De Rerum Natura, um, which is much celebrated today as a kind of rationalist, atheistic poem a kind of Richard Dawkins in a toga. Um, and there's a famous line in it that, that, that opened the passage of Lucretius that, that I studied at school. It was, Tantum religio potuit suadere malorum. Um, to such heights of evil is religio capable of inspiring people to behave. So you can see why this is a, this is a line that has a lot of traction in kind of atheist uh, websites, so you'll often find it on on, um, on websites <laughs> devoted to proving that that religion is nonsense, that it's all superstition. And back when I did did my level, you know, we were told by by our teacher, yeah, religion means religion. So we said essentially the, the the meaning of this of this line is that, that religion is a load of rubbish and it's 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 malevolent rubbish and you should get rid of it. Um, and so, you know, I think I was 15 at the time, lots of, of kind of eager, atheistic giggling at that. Um, we kind of enjoyed that. <laughs> but there's a problem, which is again, that um, just as with Threskeia, religio does not mean religion. Again, religio has this idea of, it literally means a binding. So it's, it's something that, the, the idea is it's something that binds you to a god, to a deity, to um, a supernatural agent. So it could be a sacrifice, it could be uh, adopting a priesthood, it could be um, honouring a, a, a festival. And of course in Rome, as in Greece, although perhaps even more so, there were gods everywhere. And so there were any number of religiones. And there was this kind of pressing sense of anxiety that you, you might miss out on a religio, and then a god would be pissed off and you find your life messed up. And on the scale of, of, of the city itself, so the city of Rome, it, it's a crucial part of what the elite are about, that they have to um, be respectful of the religiones. They have to, um, because by doing that, they ensure that uh, the gods look favorably on the city and thereby enable um, Rome to function. Now, the problem with all these religiones, of course, is the sheer effort of keeping track of them. And it's a kind of similar thing that in Athens, it was, there was a guy who was, was sponsored by, uh, by, by the demos, by the city, to work out, to go through all the records and to work out um, all the sacrifices that were necessary to keep the city ticking along on an even keel. And so this guy went off and he went through all the records and he totted it up. 
And he realized that actually, if they practiced all the sacrifices that tradition dictated that they should, the city would be absolutely bankrupt. So he, the, the, his findings were kind of buried. And they just carried on with the sacrifices that, um, that they already had. And so there's a similar sense of anxiety in, um, in, uh, in, in Rome as well. And this became all the more pressing in the third century AD when Roman prosperity started to crumble. Um, the, city, uh, the city celebrated its thousandth birthday. And there were lots of kind of nervous thoughts. Well, you know, we've lasted this long, but blimey, things are really going badly. We've got Persians invading in the east. We've got Goths and all kinds of hideous barbarians uh, crossing the Rhine. Uh, we've got emperors who, who can't seem to stay on, the, uh, stay on their throne for, for, for more than a week. Endless civil wars, endless assassinations. Clearly, the heavens are cross. Clearly, we're, we're messing up our religiones here. And so one of the trends across the third century AD <coughs> is that emperors start to think, well, we really ought to try and rationalize all these religiones. There are clearly far too many. If we only had one god that we had to establish a religio with, you know, how much more convenient would that be? It'd be so much more convenient. And so throughout the third century, a, a, a succession of emperors auditioned various gods for the role. So perhaps Serapis, um, so Caracalla, um, an unbelievably thuggish emperor, um, born uh, heir of, 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 of an African father, um, claimed emperor of Britain, uh, wore a, a Gallic hoodie, so that's Caracalla. Um, he was an Antonius, so he's kind of Tony the Hood. A uh, really horrible emperor, and he goes to Alexandria and Essentially, he's establishing Serapis, the great god there, as, 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 the, um, as, as, as the sole god. And when the Alexandrians get cross about this, he reacts in a perfectly uh, relaxed and, and um, temperate way by slaughtering thousands of them. And I'm glad to say that uh, a few months later, while invading Persia, uh, he went off for a pee and got assassinated. And, uh, clearly, he got the wrong religion. <laughs> And then there are others, so Constantine, a century after Caracal, at the beginning of the 4th century, he auditions uh, Apollo, he auditions Heracles, he auditions Sol Invictus, the unconquered son. It's all of these might be the one god. And then, of course, he's fighting a civil war by the Milvian Bridge, crossing over into Rome. And before he fights the battle, he has a vision of the cross, or so it is said. And he's told that if he fights, under this sign, then Christ will bless him and will bless the empire. And Constantine fights under the sign of the cross. He wins the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And so he decides that he's going to pin his fortunes to this new god, a god who, of course, had been uh, an object of much suspicion in the 300 years um, since the emergence of Christianity. Of Christianity. Now, Constantine doesn't really have a strong sense of what he's letting himself into. But by the end of the reign, he has come to understand that the Christian God is really a God unlike any other. Because all the other gods, the emperor is kind of in charge. The emperor is the Pontifex Maximus. He's the high priest. He's the guy whose role in the state is structured around the notion that he has the responsibility to mediate between the Roman people and the dimension of the divine. But this is not the case with the church. The church already exists. The church has emerged over 300 years and has an identity that is quite distinct and indeed, in a sense, antagonistic to the Roman state. There is a strong sense in the Christian church that the Roman Empire, the empire that had crucified Jesus, that had persecuted um, the saints, that had inflicted martyrdoms on it, that was enshrined in the book of Revelation as the whore of Babylon, that this empire, in a sense, was distinct and inferior to the church, that the church was something aside from it. 
And this for Roman emperors was, was, was something unsettling. Now, they, they come to live with it because what the church offers, a kind of vast welfare state uh, and a source of authority and power that over the course of the succeeding centuries will enable the Roman Empire to survive a, a large number of dislocations and shocks. What, what that means is that, that the concept of religio starts to mutate. <clears throat> So there is now only the one religion because there is only the one God. <coughs> but that notion of, of religio, the, 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 the notion of there being sacrifices, priesthoods, holy days, going back to the time of Romulus, this goes, this fades. <coughs> and what happens instead is that the responsibility for religio, the responsibility for maintaining a kind of communion with the divine, settles on a very different order of people. And those people are people who have consecrated their entire lives to God. And they are, as I said, they are, they are monks, they are hermits, they are nuns. These are people who consecrate their virginity to God, they consecrate what that they eat barely anything, they mortify the flesh, they suffer intensely for God, and this is what it is to, 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 to be, um, to have religio. You, you, it, it has translated from the dimension of the public sphere, the Roman sphere of the state, and become something that is distinct and separate from it. Now, over the course of the Middle Ages, so, The, the process by which um, in the West, in the Latin West, Roman power implodes and fades and ebbs away. And what is left of that structure that Constantine would have recognized is the church. And the shock troops of that structure continue to be the monks, continue to be the, nun, the nuns, the hermits, those who consecrate themselves to God. And so this for people in the Middle Ages, as the peoples of Europe are converted and then trained in the practice of, of the Christian faith. These are the religiones. These are the people who have religion. And these are people whose gaze is fixed on the dimension of the other world, of, of the diurn, of, of, of the eternal, um, of the, the dimension of the divine. And against them is counterpointed the dimension of what is called the cyclum. Again, the cyclum is a, is a Latin word that derives from the pagan age. And a cyclum is the span of a human life, or rather of human memory. And so every cyclum, uh, a celebration is held to, to celebrate the birth of Rome, for instance. And it's generally felt that this could be 80 years, 100 years, 120 years. Now, ultimately, it comes to kind of be settled on 100 years. So, 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 so century derives from cyclone. But what you have in the idea of the cyclone is that um, stuff gets forgotten. So you as a child might speak to your great-grandfather, and you might hear his memories, and then you will have them, but then you will die and those memories will go forever. So to inhabit the dimension of the cyclum is to inhabit a dimension in which things are swept away like kind of leaves on a, on a street. And so you have in this counterpointing of, of religio, the sphere where people's minds are focused on the eternal, on the divine, counterpointed to the cyclum, the dimension where things, you know, just turn around. Every year there's some kind of harvests and reaping and planting and sowing. And so it goes on and on and on. And this is the cycle of the cycle. And so throughout the Middle Ages, you have this idea of there being these two rival domains. And in the High Middle Ages, the age of, 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 the, of the, the, the imperial papacy, where popes lay claim to a power, 
over the entire world. So over the course of the Middle Ages, you get this sense of religio and cyclum as being distinct spheres. And this is something very radical and novel. It's not something that had existed in classical antiquity. It's not something that the Jews, who are really the only minority in Latin Christendom, they didn't really have an understanding of it. In the Islamic world, there isn't really anything comparable to this division between the spheres of religio and cyclo. It's very, very distinctive to, to Latin Christendom. And then in the 16th century, with the Reformation, it becomes even more distinctive. Because what the Reformation does is to put a premium on the individual and his or her relationship with God. So rather than relying on a church, rather than relying on monasteries, rather than relying on nunneries or the wandering friars or the hermits for the mediation, instead what the Reformation does is to say there is a personal relationship between you as a believer and God. And so, again, the understanding of religio starts to mutate and change. And by the 17th century, in England, you're starting to see these two kind of opposed senses of what religion can mean that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So you have, um, first of all, this idea that, um, that, 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 that a religio, a religion we can start to call it now, is, is a proper way of organizing a nation's understanding of God. So, in the reign of Charles I, the civil wars, at stake really is our, our arguments about what God wants, because it is assumed that if England does not have the correct religio, the correct religion, then God will be angry. And that's you know, there's something that goes back to, back, back to Roman times in a way. Um, but the anxiety is the same, that if, we, if, we, if, 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 if the correct religion is not being practiced, then, then God will be angry. So, so Charles I says, to such heights of evil, uh, sorry, no, he doesn't, that's where I'm um, <laughs> The only firm foundation of all power, that cast loose or depraved, no government can be stable. And of course, Charles I um, uh, discovers the hard way <laughs> that if you don't have... Uh, you know, if you don't have a consensus on religion, then uh, all sorts of awful things can happen, perhaps including having your head chopped off. But at the same time, you also have, because it, among the, 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 the hotter Protestants, the devouter Protestants, the Protestants that end up kind of winning the Civil War, this sense that religion is about your personal relationship with God. And so, under Cromwell, such is the premium that is set on the personal relationship with God, that Cromwell allows a broad tolerance. So rather than kind of leaning on people and persecuting people who don't want to all follow the same religion, he says basically that's fine. You, you just believe what you want, that's okay. And that ultimately becomes the model that will pass into the modern period. And it works because of that medieval division between religio and the secular. Or to anglicise it between the dimension of religion and the secular. And what then happens is, when, for instance, the British in the 18th and the 19th century go to, say, India, Hindustan, they arrive there and they look around them and they say, OK, so what is the religion here? And the answer is, there isn't one. Because the religion is a wholly Protestant concept, as the, the British understand it. Does that stop the British kind of imposing their concept of religion on Hindustan? No, it doesn't. They're speaking English, they make Indians learn English, and so Indians learn this word religion. And there's a kind of um, synergy between reformers, religious reformers in India, and evangelical Protestants who've come from England to try and define a mutually acceptable understanding of what religion in Hindustan might be. Now, there are, you know, there are various religions in, in, uh, in India, of which Islam, of course, is, is, is a huge one. But the main one, it, 
what, what is the religion of, of the Hindus? The Hindus are the, the people of India. So British people start, British officials, colonial officials, uh, start to say, okay, well this must be Hinduism. And then the people who, who supposedly practice this religion start to think of themselves as Hindus as well. So Hindu goes from being a description of someone who lives in Hindustan to becoming a description of someone who practices the Hindu religion. And the same thing happens with another religion invented by the British, Buddhism. Again, there was, there was no equivalent to Buddhism in any Indian language as there was no equivalent to the word Hinduism. But because English becomes the lingua franca in the Raj, not just the concept of religion and the secular, but of Hinduism Buddhism becomes internalized by the elites in India. And so by the time that um, India becomes independent, the Indian leaders of the independence movement have no problem in defining the kind of government they want as secular. Because as in England in the uh, 17th century, what the secular does is to provide a space where different religions can operate. But it's hard to emphasize the degree to which this is a mutation from what had existed in India before the British arrived. And so you see this kind of strange evolution from the Roman Empire channeling through medieval England, ma 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 channeling through medieval Europe, through the Reformation, and then being exported across the world, so that now you have, it's not just India that is self-defined as secular, Japan does as well. You know, neither of these countries are Christian, but the notion of the secular is a deep Christian one. And so wherever it exists, that country to a degree has been Christianized. There's an Indian scholar who's, who, who, who has said kind of very shrewdly that Christianization happens in two ways. It happens through conversion, which is the way that most people tend to think, and it happens through secularization. Now, I, I'm just going to read one, I, I'm aware I've actually been going far too long, but I'm just going to read one short passage which comes from um, uh, the record of a British surgeon in, um, in Gujarat in 1825 because this will now take us back to Greece and Rome. And he is watching um, a widow uh, incinerate herself on the funeral pyre of her husband. Um, and there's a lot of debate among uh, Hindu reformers and uh, British missionaries about whether this should be legalized. And in due course, the, the practice will be banned. But, but this British surgeon watching it is rather impressed by the spectacle of, um, of this, this woman, this widow, demonstrating her love for her husband by throwing herself into the funeral pyre. And he describes himself in this manner. He says, contrasted with the lukewarmness of the rest, i.e. The, the, the other women who were gathered watching, there was a kind of loftiness of manner in the victim herself, a gracefulness of speech and attitude, approaching to my conception of the sublime, or the inspiration of a pythoness at the delivery of an oracle. Of course, he's not talking about a snake. Not comparing her to a snake, he's comparing her to the Pythia, to the um, to the goddess who uh, channels Apollo in, at Delphi in ancient Greece. And so, what he is doing there, and this is you know where it begins, is he's back projecting this idea of religion onto the Greeks. And so, we've gone full circle. The notion of of religio, which originates in in ancient Rome is adapted by the Christians, and over the course of time, we get classically educated Europeans with a variant of the word religion, back projecting that concept onto the Greeks and the Romans and indeed the Assyrians and the Egyptians and whoever. And part of the problem with this is that it's almost impossible to talk about what we mean by religion in reference to the Greeks and Romans without kind of Christianizing them. 
And this is really the challenge in writing about classical antiquity and making sense of classical antiquity is that to use a modern European language to do that, these languages are so impregnated with Christian assumptions that it's incredibly difficult to use them as tools for describing how the ancients thought. So Christianity, although you know, the pews may be emptying and, 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 and fewer and fewer people may define themselves as practicing believing Christians, there is a kind of haze that has been left by the centuries, indeed the millennia, of, of, of Christian practice in Western Europe that means that the dust is kind of everywhere. I mean, if you're hostile to Christianity, you might say it's a kind of asbestos dust that you can't help but breathe in. If you're positive towards it, you might say it's a kind of perfume that lingers in the air. But it is very, very, very difficult to get to grips both with what is truly revolutionary about Christianity. I mean, this is an incredibly transformative process. And also with just how alien and strange classical antiquity is. And that is why Classics for All is such a wonderful charity. Because you can read classical texts in English, but for the reasons I, I hope that I've been talking about this evening, those English texts will inevitably be treacherous. If you can get back to the original text, if you can have a sense of what religio meant that is not clouded by all the subsequent Christian accretions, then you will have a chance of understanding what ancient Rome is about. And as is the case, whenever you, you, you access a different culture, it's mind broadening because you will have a sense of how infinite and variable human civilization can be. And that's why learning Latin, learning Greek is such an immense privilege and it's the kind of thing that once you've done it you will never regret it. So thanks very much. Uh, Tom has kindly said we will answer some questions. So, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Shall I start off, Julie? Yes, please. Just to, just to start off, Tom. Um, a, uh, somebody defined ancient religion as performance indexed piety. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was really rather good because it yeah. didn't sound in the slightest bit like Christian religion. Well, and, you know, ri ri ritual and all that stuff. That seems to be an essence of ancient religion, that, that was yeah. absolutely the essence, which certainly is not of modern religion in quite that sense. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's very transactional, I think it's, I think it's the essence. Yes. But obviously it's more complicated than that, as you know. I mean, it's, it, it, there is this idea, you perform a sacrifice and then the gods look after you. Mm. And if, 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 if something terrible happens to you, then that's because you've, you've neglected to, to give the gods their due. But uh, you know, undoubtedly, there, there, there are also kind of personal relationships that Greeks and Romans have with, with the gods. And there is a kind of, of, of yearning for that. So one of the things that, um, <coughs> that, that, that both Christianity and rabbinical Judaism kind of emerge into is, is in the century before Christ, um, there are a lot of, of Gentiles who find the Jewish God the most impressive of all, because precisely because he seems kind of inordinately powerful compared to all the other gods. Um, and so there's a lot of debate in the Jewish world about whether this is a good or a bad thing. Is it good to encourage Gentiles to worship the Jewish God or not? Um, is, is the Jewish God preeminently a God of Israel, or is he preeminently a God who's created the entire world? And there's a whole spectrum of opinion on that. And there's a sense in which um, what emerges as Christianity is, is the kind of, yeah, he's the God of the whole world. Everyone can have a bit of it. And what emerges as rabbinical Judaism is that, yeah, he's the God of Israel. You've got to become a Jew to worship him. Um, 
And it's in that sense that, that I think both rabbinical Judaism and Christianity are recognizably shaped by the experience of belonging to, to, to this world in which there are seekers, Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, whatever. Um, and the sense that, that, that this kind of transactional relationship with the divine is, is, is a bit reductive, really. People are kind of happy with that, but you know, it's, it gets a bit dull. And so one of, one, of the, one of the kind of great popular myths about, um, about the triumph of Christianity after Constantine is that um, hordes of Christians rush around smashing up all the temples. Um, they don't. Uh, occasionally you'll get kind of lives of saints that say that they do this, but they're almost certainly not true because the archaeological evidence points pretty definitely to the fact that by the third century most of these cults were starting to go into abeyance, that they were dependent on the wealth of uh, powerful noblemen um, to invest in them and to keep them going, and that in an age of civil war and collapse, that simply wasn't there. So the parallel actually with the temples is, is that they're a little bit like churches now, perhaps, in England. That the churches are there, they're very ancient, but what do you do with them? You know, do you turn them into post offices, or you know, what do you do with them? Yes. I'm just wondering if I knew before, you speak, speak up, um, Yes, another key difference between Christianity and the rest is that the rituals ensure that the God can see and smell and hear and taste and feel what you're doing in the ritual, as though he had five senses. Whereas the Christian God sees right into your heart and he knows whether you're just making it. Yes. Um, Tom, would it be possible for you to repeat the question? Yes. So, so, so um, the, the the Greek gods and the Roman gods oh, are much more. Question. We're just, it's just yeah, are, are, are kind of corporeal. They're, they're they're fleshier. You give them, you know, sacrifices of blood, and they are imagined as being it. Uh, whereas whereas the Christian god, that's not the case. Although of course there is a kind of blood sacrifice in the the, the, the bread and the wine that you eat, which is the, the sacrifice of, of, of Christ himself. And yeah, I think that that. that I think that what, what emerges as Protestantism centuries later, this idea that you have a personal relationship with God, is absolutely there, implicit within the Hebrew Bible. <coughs> you know, God speaking to Moses, God speaking to Abraham. This idea that, that you can have a personal relationship with this God, and yet this God is unfathomably great and powerful. You know, he's created everything. And I think it's that it's that fusion of of the kind of the cosmic and the intimate that marks both Judaism and Christianity out, and explains to me why they are with us still when the temples of Athena <coughs> and Serapis have long since crumbled into dust. But he sees and judges intention, which yes. you can't do with any ritual. <coughs> yes, and so and so that's the personal relationship. I think we have time for two more questions. In fact, there's very convenient. Oh, there's nothing. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask you very quickly. So, I think yours was the last. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, if you could uh, comment in the context of what you have just said, if you could comment on, you know, the the, the story in Bakke, you know, with Dionysus, you know, where you get the god actually acting in in the play. And he, he, you know, he, he, he talks to them about a new experience, and you know, how 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 yeah. do you so there are, so there are, yeah okay. So so what about the backy? What about um, the, the personal your personal relationship you have with, with Dionysus, where you surrender to to the backic rituals? And there are certainly parallels there, and there are parallels also in the cult of Kibale, um, whose uh, devotees notoriously castrate themselves as, as, as evidence of their commitment. To their uh, object of their worship, which is something that <laughs> you know, I suppose Oregon is meant to have done it, but mostly Christians didn't do. And it's really telling that the Roman authorities tried to ban them all. <coughs> they, they they tried to ban back its rituals. They tried to ban the cult of Kibale. They tried to ban Christianity. They periodically threw the Jews out. And so there is, I think, this sense uh, among the Roman elite <coughs> that a kind of personal relationship like that is dangerous. 
Now, why does why does Christianity triumph when um, when uh, when the Baki and um, when the Baki rights and, <coughs> and the cult of Kibale don't? I just think that getting incredibly pissed or hacking off your testicles is kind of less immediately um, popular, perhaps, than um, a church that will look after you if you get locked up in prison. I think it's uh, to be very relevant. Yes, and there was yes. Um, in your sort of account of the time and it sort of changes over time, you didn't mention the split um, in Christianity between orthodoxy and Catholicism. No. Do you think that plays any role? Uh, Orthodox Christianity is a, you know, it's a difference between Christian, uh, between Orthodox and, <coughs> and Catholic Christendom in the Middle Ages. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a, a considerable one. And the principal difference, of course, is that um, there's no figure analogous to the papacy. And the papacy matters because it, it's not about personal ambitions of the papacy. What happens in the 11th century in Europe is that in the absence of an emperor with the heft and status of the emperor in Constantinople, revolutionaries, and I use that word very advisedly, who in Latin Christendom want to basically baptize the whole world. They want to cleanse the world. They want to um, purify the whole of society. And they do this by seizing control of the bishopric of Rome and turning the bishopric of Rome into what we would now recognize i.e. a bishopric that can claim a kind of moral and spiritual authority over everyone. And the mark of that capture of the papacy by these revolutionaries is that they set out to humble the emperor. So there is an emperor in the West. He kind of is based in, 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 in what's now Germany. And the marker of his humiliation is that he's made to wait out in the snow and to get a blessing from the Pope. So the, the, the difference is that in, in Constantinople, the options for doing that don't exist because the relationship between church and emperor is kind of what it's been since, since the time of Constantine with kind of variations. But in, in the West, because the figure of the emperor is much weaker, therefore there is scope for, 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 for revolutionaries who get associated with the papacy to impose an idea that the whole of society can be changed. And that, of course, is an idea that, that is pregnant with implications for the future, because what do they call this process of change, of revolution? They call it reformatio. And that's the word that is then used by Luther and <coughs> Calvin. So actually what we call the Reformation is just a second reformatio. And then in the Enlightenment, again, and the French Revolution, and the Russian Revolution, and even today, so what, you know, when people are woke, Wokeness is another reverberation of that desire for reformatio. It's, it's, if you're woke, you want the world to be pure. You want, you want justice, you want equality. And you're prepared to do it in a kind of radical way. And this is something that has just returned, I mean, it happened again and again and again throughout the European history. Mine wasn't a question, it was just a comment really. <laughs> Uh, the, the same old, same old thing uh, which our elites and our educated people have got rid of, superstition, is still very, very powerful. Not only in more primitive societies, but in our society. Well, I really do think there's a huge number of people are superstitious in a very strong way. And it's really amazing how that has carried on right through everything. Well, Lucretius would agree with you, of course. Uh, but, but, but what I would say is that, that, that one person's superstition is another person's devoutly held belief. And so the, the, the issue of what is religio and what is superstitio is, is something that is um, constantly being negotiated. I know, but I was, I was reading the Agamemnon again recently, and there's this belief that actually your actual words that you're using in describing something you're frightened of call it the wrong thing, that'll make it happen, the, the actual magic power of words. Yeah, well, and we still have that. Oh, don't say that. That's, you know, it might happen. Well, the, the, um, the, the line of Lucretius I read is, is prefacing the account of Agamemnon sacrificing Agamemnon. Oh, really? So, oh. <laughs> you know, this is, this is supposedly is, is a ritual that is demanded by Artemis, otherwise she won't let the fleet sail to Troy. Uh, 
but equally, you know, it's killing your daughter. So that's what that's what the Buddhist is talking about. Uh, and you know, if you have a, you know, a, a god that demands something that is wrong, then you've got tragedy. Right. I think on that note, um, thank you very much, Tom. Um, I think that um, maybe your comments about your not being Ciceronian aren't quite true, because <laughs> there seems to me to be something very Ciceronian about starting a speech by saying, well, I haven't prepared this and I don't know what I'm going to talk about, and then to produce this extraordinary lecture where you talk about all the things you say you're not going to talk about, and actually make us think about it in a completely different way. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.